Not all of us could be there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So welcome, welcome everyone. It's just such a pleasure and honor to have all you here. I'm Julia Allison. I am an MC MPA here at HKS. It has been a pleasure and it's intense. Um, so I'm just gonna give a, a short introduction, but before I do, I wanna remind everyone that we are doing this online as well. And so there are mics in the ceiling that can pick up sound. So if you would um, be mindful of that and not have side conversations or you know, click and clack on things, that would be so great. Thank you so much. Um, if you want to understand about the internet, you need to read Taylor Lawrence. That is an article from Bloomberg and I find it to be true. In fact, Taylor is one of the best known and most innovative tech journalists of her generation. Currently the technology reporter for the Washington Post business section, formerly of the New York Times, you may have heard of that paper. She has innovated in the online creator and technology industry. She has also written for The Atlantic, New York Magazine, Rolling Stone, and many others. She is frequently on NPR, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, and the BBC. She is not messing around. But she doesn't just do legacy media. Taylor is one of those rare genre breaking reporters who slays at social. She has hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok, Instagram, and what's that website? Twitter X, something like that. Town and Country called her the Bob Woodward of the TikTok generation. And um, she also has been honored by the World Influencers and Bloggers Association as Media Influencer of the Year in 2023. So you're in a room with her. She also made Fortune's 40 Under 40 list of leaders in the media and entertainment. And just a few years ago, Taylor was walking around Cambridge as a Neiman Fellow and a Berkman Klein Fellow because one fellowship was not enough for Taylor. On October 3rd, she published her first book, Extremely Online, the Untold Story of Fame, Influence, and Power on the Internet with Simon & Schuster. I can't tell you to buy it, but you could if you wanted to. It's got an unbelievable amount of publicity, including features in nearly every publication you can think of, including a Ray review in the New York Times. I've been following Taylor's distinctive career for many years, and I am deeply grateful that she chose to tell my story in the book. I don't know what chapter it is, but it's one of the chapters. She's an exceptional writer and a courageous advocate for women, especially women who have been mistreated in the media. We are so grateful she's come to Harvard to talk about online influence and the future of media, interviewed by the incisive Shorenstein News Lab director, Emily Dreyfus. Thank you to the Shorenstein Center for putting on this important event, and thank you for being here, Taylor. Let's have a warm round of applause. Thank you. Julia. Okay, can you guys hear me? Mike, my COVID. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I just turn it on. That little. Yeah, this one? Yeah. That was the nicest oh, intro, nice. by the way. <laughs> it really was. It made me want to follow you and buy your book if I didn't already. Um, okay, so I'm Emily Dreyfus. I am the director of the Shorenstein Center News Lab and also a technology journalist, um, formerly of Wired Magazine, and just a huge admirer of Taylor's, I should say. Um, as for some context of the book, I want to just begin by mentioning that I was a technology journalist through all of the era that the book is about. <laughs> um, I worked at a website called CNET, where, you know, we reviewed cameras <laughs> and other things, and I lied in my interview that I knew what technology gadgets were. Like, I was really, I didn't understand what was happening, but I learned on the job, and I watched Taylor begin her career, I became aware of you, I think, when you were a business insider. And frankly, what I saw happen to Taylor at the beginning was that nobody understood what she was talking about. Um, and the editors at these publications, like the publications where I worked, did not find the stories that Taylor was pitching legitimate um, because she was pitching stories about what people were actually doing online and the only stories about the internet that traditional media editors at that time thought were worth anything were the stories about people creating products, the stories about people 
messing up those products and the people funding products. And it was all about products. And I can tell you that we all in those newsrooms would say, you know, we really got to get a human element in here. Like, we should be focusing more on people, but nobody knew how to do that. And enter Taylor, who has really forged that um, field, I would say, that niche, that beat. Um, so Taylor, first I just want to ask you. You guys are hyping me so much. <laughs> well, I mean... It's fair. It's yeah. fair. I would. I when I talk about Taylor, I also just like refer to her as a hustler because she, <laughs> this woman, hustles. So that's what I want to ask you about first and foremost. What was it like writing an actual like old school tome of a print history book while also publishing through the Washington Post and um, being harassed online and dealing with everything that you deal with? How was it? Yeah, well, um, I know there's other people in this room that have written books, and it's incredibly hard. It's way harder than I thought it was. Um, when I got my book deal, I thought, people write books all the time. I can just do this. I remember my editor at the New York Times being like, do you want to take book leave? And I was like, no, it's just like right on the side a little bit. And, um, it was it was very time consuming. Um, also, because I wanted to write a history book, basically, so much of it was going back and doing research. Um, and I have to give a shout out to the Internet Archive. Yeah. I could have this book would not have existed without the Internet Archive. Um, just it was yeah because I had to go back and find all the source material. There wasn't actually a lot of journalism about the stuff that I was writing about back then. So yeah. So. Um, that kind of gets at one thing I've always been interested in about the internet, which is ephemerality. Like we we talk about how you put stuff out on the internet and then it disappears. In the creator world, I feel like that is even more true. Sometimes people will put, they'll only post things in stories or they will post something that is um, maybe paid content, but delete it and you won't see it. Can you talk a little bit about the role ephemerality played in writing your book and also just in the influencer world? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, actually, I think a, a lot of social media is not ephemeral in the way that like everything in the sort of broadcast based social platforms that I think defined the 2010s, almost everything was default public and permanent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Snapchat obviously changed a little bit of that with the introduction of stories. But um, but it was it was a lot of old websites that were really hard to find. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the coverage was like on broken links. And I actually realized, I mean, a lot of the websites that I wrote for, even I was trying to find my own stories, have been gone. And so definitely yeah. PDF all your old articles or put them in the internet archive. But um, but yeah, it was. It, I think social media. It's just it's very tricky, and content creators, as you mentioned, just delete content all the time, and it's not. And I do that myself. We all archive our Instagram posts, and you know, um, so screenshots are good. And a lot of um, what I found a lot of helpful was there was a lot of these like quite toxic forums actually that Julie is familiar with. That do they're horrible and they're documenting things for the wrong reason, but they are kind of almost the only people that I could find that were like really archiving a lot of social media posts. I found the exact same thing when last year I was researching my book, Meme Wars. We relied so much on the 4chan archive to be, to double check what had happened in the early internet because it was still there. Yeah. Um, okay, so. I just want to, I really personally want to hear your thoughts on where we are with social media right now, because it seems to me that it is chaos. Um, but also, as you note in the book, during the COVID era, there was this finally um, a reckoning and recognizing that online media and content creators are legitimate creators, and they are in a place where a lot of people actually get their information. Um, and that they are the kind of crucible of culture. So if we care about culture, then we should care about what they're saying. But then as that is true, we also have seen like the, the end of Twitter RIP and, and just a feeling that I have and I think a lot of other technology journalists have and a lot of people have that like we're entering some sort of new era. Yeah. Where are we going? Yeah, um, I know I kind of end the book around 2022, um, not just because that's when it was due, but also <laughs> because I do think it was a good sort of like talking point. It was right before Elon took over Twitter that I kind of pretended, which I think is like, I mean, his Twitter was always going to be radically different and he planned to sort of do a lot of things at the site. But I think we're, I think the next phase of social media, one, I don't know that any of these Twitter clones are going to take off. Like one for one, I don't think that's how it's going to be. There's almost never a one for one. I mean, the end of Vine is a good example. Like, obviously, what came next was Musical.ly and TikTok. It's more of an evolution. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think there's a room for text-based media, but it's so hard to monetize and it's tricky to grow that I don't think it's going to be like a one-to-one thing. Um, I also think people are spending time, and this has been a big time for the past few years too, of people spending time in more closed communities, um, places like Discord or group chats or Telegram. I'm so interested in Telegram and I've been trying to write about it more recently because it's it's a app that also has a lot of like group sort of social dynamics and um, it's like sort of an early place where things will go viral before they spread to these big platforms. And it's almost a publisher as well. Yeah, there are so many news outlets or news journalists who are only posting on Telegram. Yeah. Especially, I mean, we, we looked into this when we were writing um, on my team at Shorenstein Center about the uh, Ukraine, like the, the offensive against Ukraine, and so many Ukrainians were going to Telegram to get their information. Um, what do you think about the, like, there's a lot of hand wringing in the traditional media about how there's, you know, fact-checked reporting that has gatekeepers and editors versus influencers online. Um, and I think Telegram is a really good example of a place that kind of straddles both. Um, what do you make of all of the hand wringing that, that kind of points the finger at influencers of saying, like, this is why truth is dead um, and people are getting misinformation? <laughs> what do you well, make of that? people are getting a lot of misinformation from yeah. influencers. So, but they're not the reason that, like, truth is dead. I think, like, I've heard just, like, that sort of, there's a lot of hostility towards traditional media. And there's also a lot of, like, glamorization of traditional media. And, you know, I think having more in these institutions institutions very biased editorial choices all the time. They publish things that are demonstrably false often, more, way more often than you think, even in places like the New York Times and others. So um, that's not to equate them completely with content creators, but you, could, you also do have a, a sort of a type of content creator that does excellent journals. And Coffeezilla is a good example. Um, and I think the New York ended up writing about him, but he's this YouTuber that led a lot of crypto investigations. And I think is a true journalist. Yeah, I mean, I actually just learned about him from my extremely online brother. Um, and because I was writing a piece, I hasn't published yet, so pray for me. Um, but writing a piece about the creator economy, and I wanted to figure out like how you know if people get deals or not. And I relied so much on his videos yeah. because this guy actually tries to out um, kind of scammers online and say, Coffee Zilla. Yeah, and he's on YouTube, Coffeezilla. Yeah, he just does great. I mean, he what he does is real journalism. And and then you have other people like Cleo Abram and Johnny Harris, like people that left Vox, like left traditional media that are building huge audiences online, also doing very serious journalism. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, I don't think it's one or the other. I think the problem is is that most people, like most of the influencers, are speaking on issues. They're speaking on it just like they're just giving commentary. They're not doing reporting. Right. And I think that's the problem. It's a lot of people don't realize that they're getting their news actually from commentary channels and commentary people. And there's fewer and fewer people doing the actual reporting. Which is also then ironic when so many of the people who are on social media are kind of anti-traditional media. Yeah. But they are relying on traditional media to get their facts because it's traditional media that is actually investing in unique reporting. And then they're like layering like, on top of that. Um, so what do you think about, okay, well, my one question is, can you, I think you're the person who might understand best in this world how creator deals happen. And, and like in your book, you kind of talk a lot about Julia's story and how um, women online were forging a path toward becoming legitimate content creators online, but it didn't start monetized. And that whole like how to make money issue is really at the heart of what is so wrong with the internet right now. How does it work for influencers to make money? And, and are, are they mostly making money or not? Um, well, there, it's so hard to know, first of all, how many content creators there are because right. the government doesn't really track it, which is so crazy to me. And the tech companies don't have to give us any information no. about it either. YouTube, I mean, some of them, like, they publish these reports, like, we've monetized, you know, 70 million people have monetized on our platform or something. But it's hard to know kind of how much money they're making, what are these companies worth? I mean, each each influencer is its own, they're, they have, basically they're their own little media company. Right. And it, that sometimes that's just them individually. Sometimes they have teams, I mean, Marquez Brownlee has like 200 people, I think, working for him now. Oh my God. Um, awesome. He has a whole office in New Jersey. It's very much like his own. He's one of the best like tech YouTubers. Um, so, you know, I think it just kind of, Kind of, it depends how you monetize. I mean, early on, it was extremely hard. I talk about the mommy blogger era in my book a lot and how these women 
put blog, um, banner ads on their blogs and the vitriol that, that was they were met with. Mm, like, like you're selling out. Yeah, it was, well, it was like, you're, you're monetizing your life and your, you know, your children should be taken away. And these were not like the family bloggers that I think actually are truly doing that today. Like a lot of these women were writing pseudonymously or they weren't even, they didn't have photos on their blogs. They were just writing like deeply personal things about motherhood, but just, women taking economic control control and also they were they were talking about a lot of like very feminist ideas back then which people didn't you know never like um well you talk about tumblr a lot in the book and um i, I think of tumblr as, as a place where like feminist culture was able to thrive online which in the early days of the internet was not true of every forum um to say the least and then tumblr kind of made stars of people uh, how much do you think we owe to Tumblr? Well, I owe my entire career to Tumblr <laughs> <laughs> because that's where I got my start. Um, but I mean, it was so hard to monetize. Like, I mean, I was talking to Julia about this just like literally last night. It's like because she was this like you know hugely influential influencer that if she had that level of fame and media attention today, it would you could take that and become a multimillionaire because right. you can convert the attention so easily to money. Back in like the late aughts, there just there weren't those revenue pathways. And even Tumblr, like when I was big on Tumblr, like the best that I could do was leverage it into like a media job, you know, which is what a lot of people yeah. did. The really high paying media yeah. jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, now it's totally different. And I think also I talk in the book, and um, there's this reporter at the New York Times, Sapna, who covers she now she covers she's covered e-commerce. And um, there's I think you could write a whole book about sort of like e-commerce's role in this, like platforms like Shopify and there's other platforms like Pietra and others that allow content creators to really spin up, like spin up product lines really quickly. So they don't have to promote someone else's products and they can just, you know, they, they're building their own sort of like businesses. But I all, yeah, that's really interesting. And then I see all these people on Instagram who are like serving me ads for what seem like bespoke little companies that are made for the social media era. And they're just like selling products that I think they've made you know, buying from a factory. Right. Drop shipping. Yeah. Well, exactly. Um, and I, like, to me, that's some, that seems like a sign of Instagram's decline. Well, that it's over on a shopping. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I mean, Instagram is in a weird spot right now. I think TikTok has gone really hard into shopping. Mm -hmm. um, they want to turn it all into shopping. I, mean, I, I don't think it's going to work that well, but maybe. I mean, yeah, the, the people, the influencers are making massive amounts off um, Amazon affiliate. Right, sure, fine revenue. So, yeah, maybe you can take all of that and just keep it on TikTok and like that. The lifestyle categories on TikTok will make a lot of money, but um, I think people want to do more on social media than just shop, you know. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I would love to talk about some of the darker sides of social media because I think um, that's what a lot of tech journalists now write about, right? We, we point out the failings and the dangers, the anti Semitism and the misogyny. Um, and in some ways, tech journalists do that now as an atonement for not doing that in the past and being tech boosters of these companies for a really long time. But Taylor, you have yourself as a reporter who puts yourself out there online for sources to meet and who immerses yourself in the communities that you report on so that you can understand them, also been a lightning rod for harassment. Um, and people are constant. I mean, I wrote about, I wrote a piece for the Shorenstein Center about what newsrooms should do to support women in their newsrooms who are being harassed. And I use Taylor as the case study because the ways in which you are harassed is shocking and overwhelming. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how that harassment has influenced your work and your life? Yeah. Well, it's affecting my life a lot. I think people say on, or they think online harassment is like mean comments or something, um, which is not really an issue. I have like most notifications muted. I don't even know. I only see sometimes them trending on Twitter. Like, uh oh, what you know? What are they mad about? But I don't really see that. But um, the way it manifests is more like I mean, smear campaigns. It's online smear campaigns. It's manipulating my SEO. It's somebody paying a bot. It's like bot network right before I joined the Washington Post and message to thousands of people, like, just saying that, like, oh, tell Lorenz, you know, she's a bad journalist, and she's actually been secretly fired by the Washington Post, which I was like, I'm literally starting there next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and, or, you know, people showing up at my parents' house, and, yeah. and my parents having to leave their house, and my kids, you know, my sister's, um, you know, they tried to get my sister's kids taken away, they, like, they've just oh done, God. 
well, because you know whatever it's just like there's there's so and, and not to mention all the opportunities lost like i've been uninvited from speaking events i've been disinvited from podcasts i've had things canceled i have had had security on things and mostly because people say well oh we'd love to have you but we can't deal with the controversy or oh well, we want to do this and we want to be on the podcast but we don't want to deal with all the comments from the hate you know so, or they can't, anyway, it's, yeah. it's, it's a real problem. And I think news organizations don't understand the, the sort of the surface area of these attacks. And so they just think, well, oh, suck it up. It's just some mean comments. Just like, no, it's, that's not, if that's all it was, that would be a different issue. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, it seems like it, there's still this sense that online is not real. Yeah. And yeah. we only need to worry about offline. And, you know, traditional newsrooms have a lot of training for reporters who get sent out into the field in, in a dangerous situation. Like you covered um, the Unite the Right rally in person and got physically yeah. attacked. But it's funny because that physical assault, like the one time in my career that I've been physically assaulted, like they understood that, right? Like that, that's like, you know, immediately you're supported. But then you go through this years long, like, just smear campaign and, and harass and just like way worse than like the one time I got punched. And, right, like, right. That's but they, there's no support for that. There's yeah. no, and in fact, you're often sort of punished for it. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like the traditional newsrooms need to, and I've said this before, they need to create um, the same kind of policies that they have when they're sending someone to a war zone where they protect them and they train them how to deal with it and they have people in place to protect them. They need to have the same kind of infrastructure. For reporters like you who are, I mean, what makes your reporting so powerful, I think, and this is clear in the book, is that you actually understand the community you're in because you're living, you're on the, the communities you're reporting on because you are so online, um, which then also makes you a target. And the newsrooms benefit from your, you know, high profile, but then they don't take responsibility for that high profile putting the target on your back. Um, let's talk about like your form of journalism, if you don't mind, yeah. versus uh, like more traditional New York Times reporters or, or whatever it is. Um, because you get a lot of harassment from like far right trolls or, or not just even far right trolls, like specific powerful technology moguls. Um, but I also feel like you have um, posed a challenge to traditional journalists who thought the stories that you were reporting weren't real and have they come around like the people who used to doubt you <laughs> I don't know I mean I yeah because at this point I think every year it get, I mean I used to when I called myself a tech reporter for the first time I was calling myself a tech reporter in like 2010 early 2010 and this um high profile big time male tech journalist like joked about it. He posted a bunch of tweets like, haha, you know, if Taylor Lorenz can call herself a tech reporter, like, what's next? She reports on the site for cat videos, which is YouTube, by the way, which that's what <laughs> like, what? So, it's just like, eventually, like, that that's, that, that just shows very ignorant. Same thing with TikTok. Like, I was, I remember my editor, Queen Way at the time, was like, you know, all these Fox News headlines were like, Taylor Lorenz, TikTok reporter. And she was like, lean into that because that's like, in two years, it's going to be like, Taylor Lorenz, the definitive Google reporter. You know, like, these are important so um but it just shows their own ignorance and dismissiveness and my feeling is like that's fine they can feel that way I am quite confident in my vision of what the future will be and on my coverage and you know it is what it is but it's fine and if somebody changes their mind I'm really glad I'm not like haha remember when you posted that I did yeah. well now we are friends. I am friends with the man that posted that oh, wow. but um he was you know whatever having a day but um <laughs> but you know it's it's like great I'm welcome because this and you know it's it's good and I think a lot of people hesitate they conflate me with these changes like right and so they get very mad I did an interview last year right before right after I left the times but I was talking about like they were asking me about journalists having personal brands or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, they do have to do it these days or whatever. People were so irate. And I think it's because like they, they associate me with that future. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I'm not advocating for that, by the way. Like, I don't love that we live in that world, but I report on it. Right. I mean, one thing that I have always admired so much about your reporting is like, as I feel like you actually are able to get a beat on the zeitgeist. 
which is not always true of journalists, right? Like as a reporter, we're like reporting, this is what's happening. This thing, this event occurred, like whatever, but we don't have the context to explain the big shift that those events are happening within. Um, but I think something about the acceleration of, of culture online makes it so that if you're actually paying attention, like a trend piece, some of your trend pieces have really been able to point out like, this is what people are feeling and thinking vital, um, which I also imagine was threatening to some kinds of reporters who are like, you're not allowed to make statements about that, yeah. like that until yeah. yeah. 10 years have passed. Yeah. Yeah. But is it still possible <laughs> to do that right now without Twitter? Like, what do you think about the fact that if people are moving into more into Discord and Telegram, that it'll be harder for you or for journalists to get into the communities to see what's happening? Yeah. Well, I don't rely on Twitter almost ever for other than anything than other like talking to other media people. Um, I think I think it's true that the, that the closed communities pose a challenge, but most of my story ideas I get from talking to people and I talk to an just absurd amount of people on a daily and like a lot of reporters do. And also talking to people that are like you want to talk to people that are very plugged in themselves mm -hmm. to like different worlds. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a member of most communities, right? But like I'm talking to people that speak to them. Yeah. But but I but I do think it's harder because you have to go through almost like those kind of gatekeepers a little bit more. But at the same time, everything's on TikTok anyway. And things come out like if I I it's so funny when I write about things sometimes and people are like, oh the trend or how did you see it? And I'm like, it's been on TikTok for like a month. Like, this has been the main topic of discussion. Well, one of the things that used to drive me nuts about your reporting, honestly, is that she, like, you'd report on something that I asked myself and been like, I don't know what to do with that. It's not, not a story. I don't understand if that's a story or not. And it wouldn't be until I read your piece in The Atlantic that I'd be like, God damn it. That was an important <laughs> story. And I wasn't able to contextualize it because I also had been trained by journalists who. I think you say in the book, like, um, stuff that happens online is just seen as, like, trivial in some ways. And I really definitely thought that. Um, and I think also a lot of tech journalists are skeptical. Like, we're, we're trying to be skeptical so that we're not promoting these products or these communities. But in that way, then, we can have a like, knee-jerk negative reaction or a knee-jerk reaction that, like, something that happens is not worth writing about. Um, and I think you have put like shown that that is not the right stance to take. Um, I noticed that you're still on Twitter. Yeah, I'm on every. I'm gonna be on there until they kick me off again. Okay, so that's what I was gonna say. Like, what would it take for you to leave Twitter? Elon banning me. <laughs> <laughs> now, did he actually ban you? Yeah. The time that he, okay, he did. I got banned. I was banned right after he banned like I think six journalists. I think I can't. I think Ryan Mack got oh, Ryan Mack. Because I happened to be with Ryan Mack when I got banned. So we were all a, like um, tech journalists. Yeah. Yeah. Times. Um, yeah. He was like, "Oh, I tried to get on Twitter and you're not showing either." And I was like, "Wait, I'm not showing." It was yeah. Anyway, it was this Elon had this ridiculous. He was saying that like you know anybody that talked about this tr account that tracked his jet was like doxing him or whatever. Um, no, I but I don't use Twitter the way that I used to at all. Like I, I How Twitter's does it change. Well, so I, when I got back on. I just decided, like, I don't really want to contribute actively and, like, grow any following on here anymore because it's, right. like, just kind of di diminishing returns. Um, and I really only use it to talk to media people. So um, I just kind of decided to stop sharing news. I stopped posting for, like, a while. And then I just decided my friend works for this nonprofit that's, like, a healthcare nonprofit. I care. I'm severely immune compromised, hence my mask and shit. So... I was like, you know, she was like, well, you should just give it over to a cause or you should use your mm -hmm. thing for a cause. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll just use it to talk about sort of like COVID or, or public health. And, you know, people send me things and I amplify it. So I try to like use it for that. And sometimes I'll share like an article I wrote maybe, but even then, like barely, you know, it's just, I don't, yeah. Well, I mean, posting on Twitter now is just completely different. Like the kind of engagement you get. Who's the engagement is deranged. Yeah. And also it's just, it's such a, it's a more difficult platform to use for the things that I did use it for, which was really just to see what like other reporters were doing. Yeah. And that's a huge loss, I think. Yeah. I haven't figured out where all the reporters are hanging out yet. Um, again, <laughs> we're all in a group chat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Um, no, I think, I mean, I think a lot of people wanted threads to be that place, yeah. which it's not going to. And I don't think we have a real thing. I, I mean, I wrote a piece a couple months ago arguing, which, which I think is true, is that a lot of the core usage of Twitter is actually fulfilled by TikTok. 
That's where people totally agree. Go to yeah. talk about things. Yeah. So, but um, some of the advice to like old school journalists is to read a book like yours and understand how influencers work and how they become trusted and how they hustle so hard to like um, get seen and then to try to incorporate some of that behavior into their journalistic endeavors, which is what people mean when they say like the journalist has to create a brand or whatever. Um, what do you think about that advice that like if, to save traditional journalism, we need to turn journalists into influencers? <laughs> No, I don't. I don't think that's how the 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 post is gonna like save itself from two hundred and fifty job cuts or something. Oh, whatever, you know? it's like yeah. is if we all get TikTok accounts. I think it's like I I use myself that way because I cover online culture. I was talking to a friend who um, is an investigative reporter at the Times who covers police violence and was like, you know, should I be on? you know, should I make a YouTube or something? And I'm like, probably not actually, you know, like for you, no, maybe. But um, but I think it's really stressful as a journalist because you're so, the layoffs have been so devastating in this industry that um, you do have an upper hand if you're sort of more high profile. So um, I don't think it's that, but I do think that, I don't think that it's on, it should be on the journalists at all. Um, I think journalists should use social media to and engage with their audience. And I think it's really helpful to actually have that two-way relationship personally. But um, but I think that the organizations need to understand the shifting consumption patterns and shifting desires from their class, their consumers, like what people want. And they're delusional about what people want. Like, yeah, you know, so, and that's the bigger problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um when I see a, a well done TikTok from a traditional news brand, I'm like, oh, good job. <laughs> you did it. You did it. Because I mean, I'm a journalist and I'm getting my news on TikTok in a lot of ways. I also read papers, but like I get, I also just get a sense of how everyone is feeling about the news from TikTok, which is increasingly, I think, something people want and that journalists have been trained not to give. Well, we don't have trust in the media. And so the way that like the way that these traditional brands think about trust is like, OK, well, let's if all our reporters have no social media and we just have these brand accounts, like people will trust us because that's the brand and the corporate. And it's like, no, actually, no one wants to hear from this like corporate faceless entity. And they want people that they trust who they can frankly, know their background and know their biases and be like, you know what, like, I mean, people can say what they want to say about me or like, OK, you know what, Taylor doesn't love Elon, but she's going to write a fair story or she, you know, I know her stories are accurate, but it's like, you know, kind of more about the person that you're getting your information from. And so I think it's just such a mistake, these media companies that, that sort of are going the opposite direction and kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, I, when I think about that problem, I think about the role Facebook played yeah. in that because the Facebook newsfeed did such a number on brand awareness. Yeah. Because you guys think about before the Facebook news feed, like if you saw the New York Times or you saw the Washington Post, like you might be aware of their logo. If someone sent it to you in a blog or an email, like you, there was all this branding around it. And then for five or six years, the Facebook news feed was the main place people were posting that kind of content. And when you posted anything on the news feed, it got rid of the all of the branding and it made them it, it, your like new posting a New York Times article looked exactly the same as posting like your food that you ate for lunch and it, it just like flattened out the understanding of brand awareness um which I don't know how brands can get that back like media brands could ever get it back it's really hard I mean they're increasingly publishing as you mentioned on these third-party social platforms that don't allow any kind of customization or anything right. so you have to kind of develop your own unique visual style, which is also something that these print print legacy news brands focused on writing are not excellent at video. You yeah. know, they're just generally not. Um, I mean, so, except for when Facebook told us to pivot to video. Yeah. <laughs> um, which then led to so many Which else. led to a lot of really bad Facebook lives, you know, but yeah. I mean, my lowest point as a reporter, I will tell you, is when Facebook did this where they pivoted to video. They told all the news um, organizations like you need to be investing in video that's what people are watching okay which it, it later turned out the numbers were a lie yeah. about the viewerships but they said that we needed to do that and we did notice at Wired that if we had a live video on our Facebook page in the morning then all of the stories to our text in like investigations did better like had further reach they reached a bigger audience 
So we had this like really important investigation coming out and I taped my phone to the window at the World Trade Center and okay. just live streamed the boats so that like that would juice the algorithm to have people see our story the next day. Yeah. It's so funny. And I, I think now we all have to do these weird hacks actually yeah. to get seen. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, I think our information ecosystem is obviously dominated increasingly by algorithmic um, content delivery and that's a problem. Yeah. Because we have to cater to it. Well, um, I, I heard you say, you know, that part of the problem you think of social media these days and the, and the harms that it causes, such as harassment, misinformation, disinformation, um, all sorts of other problems, is the profit side of these tech companies. And to me, it seems like the algorithm and the profit incentives go together because they are tweaking the algorithm to... Um, you know, emphasize the things that then lead to the most money for them. What is the other alternative? You like, <laughs> is there a not a nonprofit social media really, but like there are a lot. I live in San Francisco, and there are a lot of technologists in San Francisco who are like, I want to be an ethical technologist. I want to do the right thing. Um, but then they take VC money, and you just literally cannot then, you know, do what you think is the moral right thing if you actually have to pay back millions and millions of dollars so what like is there a way to do it okay first of all i would be a successful tech if i had the answer to this <laughs> but um yeah i mean i i think one issue is that we have a monopolistic tech mm -hmm. so, totally yeah i mean it's like basically it's like you cannot compete with meta and google unless you're tiktok where you're also owned by a multi-billion dollar like tech like right. tiktok's been one billion dollars, I think um, Georgia Wells reported in uh, 2019 on marketing alone. In 2019, wow! So just on basically on app download ads, that's the level of resources that you have to sort of like invest, and you have to I'm not to mention TikTok is one of the best products on the entire brand. Like, but you have to compete. It's so hard to compete. Otherwise, you end up like Snapchat or these other like platforms, but they don't really get critical mass and they can't really stay relevant and they get all their features ripped off and like they kind of, it's just hard to compete against Meta and Google. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like so many small little like innovative social media companies have come and gone and I haven't seen a single one really last. Maybe I know. I like to go back into those. Like it's fun to go back into the ones that are gone, you know, like Peach or whatever, or Ello. Yeah. Oh God, I forgot about Ello. I think Ello was supposed but to be a nonprofit. Are some of those still just like ghost communities where yeah. people are still in there doing stuff? Oh my goodness. Yeah. There's a great piece. I think it's Helen Fitzgerald wrote for The Verge in 2019 about actually internet ghost towns. It was one of the things I was so jealous of this story. She and anyway, she talks about like going back into these platforms, which I think it's fun to go back into the platforms sort of of the past because they were so much more creative and, and yeah. like it just was, it was a sort of something from a different internet. But anyway, I think, I think we are moving away. I, I do think that again, we're moving to a different model of social media kind of. Yeah. Um, I, I think Evan Spiegel was correct in 2017 when he redesigned Snapchat to split the app. Um, I wrote about that at the time, but I do think he's right that like increasingly people want sort of like private, like they don't want to necessarily post every single thing publicly to the world. And they kind of just want to make sure it reaches the right person. Right. It's like you can dip onto something. If you want something to reach the masses and you're going to go on TikTok and do that. But like a lot of socializing, socializing just happens in, in smaller groups. Yeah, smaller groups are places where you know, even with TikTok, it's like you trust the algorithm to deliver it to people that actually care about it. Absolutely. I, my favorite TikToks are the ones where the person immediately is like, so are you a mom living in California? I have something to tell you. I'm like, how did you know? <laughs> um, it's just like, they didn't make the decision to send that to me. <laughs> TikTok works that well. Um, oh, yeah, but it's just, it seems so difficult, especially because from a technical standpoint, like if you look at the behemoths of Google and Facebook, they have just so many engineers making sure stuff runs well. And as we are seeing from Elon, firing so many people at Twitter, like you actually do need people on the team to keep it running well. So it's really hard for um, like a startup to have like four scrappy friends who have a great idea for a new app. Yeah, this is why like Blue Sky doesn't have video yet because right. they just don't have the engineering resource. They think they can't pay for the server costs or something. But then why doesn't Threads have hashtags? 
<laughs> oh yeah, I actually don't think it needs. I mean, Twitter Institute of Natural Language searched a while ago, so you don't need hashtags. But the hashtags actually reminds me of a point you make in your book, which is that often it is the users of these sites yes. that understand what they're for better, and the cre- and then kind of show the creators of the sites like, oh, the purpose of this, like the purpose of YouTube, is not just what was it dating? Yeah, it was a dating app. Um, or data platform. I, I think like with social products, and I wrote about this recently actually um, for the Atlantic. But like social products are unique types of products because there's so this, the product is in a large part also the user base in the community. Right. And so a good social product and a good team will sort of like develop the product in with the user feedback. And the apps that didn't do that have largely failed. Clubhouse, Vine. I mean, look at what Reddit did to itself. You know, by like even Tumblr banning porn. I think like or ban, you know yeah yeah. yeah. I mean, like, it's like if you if you sort of alienate your user base too much, it doesn't matter if you have the best product in the world, right? Right. Well, and the reason I was saying that about the hashtag is because the hashtag was invented by a user yeah. on Twitter. Um, Chris Messina. But you are, I love it. Um, what is going on on Tumblr these days? Oh my God. I have this office and I asked them this exact same thing. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, Tumblr is bought by Automatic, which is uh, the owner of WordPress, and actually is a really, I would say, like one of the more ethical tech companies. I'm also really a big fan of them because they didn't like abandon their building downtown San Francisco um, in the, the doom loop, like a lot of other people did. Oh, interesting. Well, they, yeah, they, um, you know, it's still around. It's a big place for art. Uh, it's very popular with art, and it's still, I mean, it's still around. It just doesn't have the cultural relevance. You know that it did. I, I would also it, the product also has not changed. You can download the Tumblr app now, and it looks almost the same as it did in 2011. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Like they need to, they need to innovate a little bit For there. A but a long time, Tumblr really also felt like the one place on the social web, at least, where it was largely women. Yeah, is true. that still true? Yeah, it's still very, it's over 50, I think it's 60, 40 or something. I actually asked them about that specifically, and I was surprised it was not higher. It's really popular for fandoms. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there's a lot of young people on there still today. Like, it's not gone. It's just, it's just not, it doesn't have that broader cultural relevance. But things come from Tumblr. I mean, Ryan Broderick said he uses Tumblr every day recently, which is shocking to me. Hmm. Still. I wonder what he's using it for. I don't know. I have it on my phone. <laughs> there's just not that much on there you know i mean i use it to read poetry because there's a lot of oh, like okay, poets yes. it's very Tumblr. like artistic space yeah um well okay so in the book you focus a lot on vine i guess i have a question for you like looking back through this era what are the things that um you wish were still around is vine one of them obviously vine i miss yeah. it so much um but, but, but Vine died also because people stopped using it, and people were very nostalgic. And yes, the company died in large part by alienating every big content creator on the app and spurring themselves over. But also, like Instagram video, really mm-hmm. hurt, the, hurt the app, and um, I do think cleaved off a lot of their users. And then Musically as well, like Musically, Musically was so ascendant even before. Vine died, and also just like people forget that pre TikTok, Musically was so you know they were thriving, and they were they were up against a lot of competition. That's why they sold, um, because they were just like getting like Flipagram and all these ones were they were getting a lot of clones. But um, but, but didn't yeah. also Vine get purchased by Twitter? And then pre, Vine was purchased by Twitter pre launch. Oh yeah, before it even launched, it was purchased by Twitter. Oh yeah. so because I feel like the popular understanding is that it was kind of Twitter's involvement that killed it oh a hundred percent twitter's mismanagement doomed the app i mean twitter just famously cannot function it's like always like number four like kind of yeah it was a lot of mismanagement but it was the founders of vine and i write about this a lot in my book like the founders of vine also just like they had this version of what they wanted that of this vision for what they wanted the app to be and when users were using it in a different way they got very hostile with them and they alien they were it was it was the opposite of user different product development. They were like kind of like mad that people weren't using the app the way they wanted it to. And the lack of monetization. Twitter has a weird relationship too because early on in the late aughts, celebrities wanted to get paid to tweet. And Twitter's stance was like, no. Huh. This was like, right. And, and Ashton Kutcher helped break this mold where Ashton Kutcher embraced it really early and started tweeting for free and like a lot of other celebrities came. But there was always this tension between the big celebrities and Twitter because they were like, well, why am I creating all this free content for you? 
This is like before Instagram, you know, before people really understood the value of social media. So when Vine launched Bohas content creators, because they're like, well, if we start paying the content creators to post, because, you know, because it was like, then the celebrities are going to want money to post tweets, which they probably wouldn't have, but that was like the fear. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then that was kind of the um, argument when, when Elon was forcing people to pay for their blue check mark. Yeah. Um, people were like, you know, I, I, you should be paying me. Right. Like, I, I think it was Stephen King who tweeted, like, I don't need to pay you for the blue check mark. You need to pay me to be on your site. So he yeah, fundamentally doesn't understand, like, the value, like, who's providing value in this situation. Yeah. So, yeah, that was crazy. I mean, I'm really personally quite sad about the demise of Twitter. Just because it felt like such a, I don't know, I just got so used to it as a place where I could express myself or I could see various different opinions. I mean, I was reminiscing about um, this weekend. It was so incredibly difficult to follow the news in the Middle East if you were trying to use social media to follow it. Um, I mean, TikTok did a pretty good job, but like... Twitter was a nightmare. Yeah, Twitter was crazy. It was an absolute nightmare. And it, you, it's so such a shame because there used to be a time where you could actually like put into Twitter and say, I only want to see tweets that are coming from this location at this time. And you would see the actual on the ground coverage. Um, and that was one of the most amazing parts of social media was like getting to see people who are actually living the life tell their story. Yeah. Well, now we can see that on TikTok, but it's much harder. And TikTok is a very closed platform. It doesn't have, you know, you can't search in the same way that you have on Twitter. And if TikTok had a better search functionality, I think it would be a much better tool for journalists than it is. Um, shall we take questions? Yeah. Um, I'll, otherwise, I'll just talk to you all night. <laughs> um, I, we have 10 minutes left. So, okay, in the back. Um, do you guys think the problem with bots will ever be fixed? The problem with bots will ever be fixed? Um, yeah, maybe, more more so. I mean, it's always one of those things where it's going to be a whack-a-mole. I think not on Twitter. Elon has absolutely no interest in really solving that problem. He seems to want to inflate his own user numbers, and so he's <laughs> sort of stopped placing bots. Yeah, it's true. I know, I know. It's um, hilarious. But um, but I do think I, I mean there's such a plague on like social media and they definitely like they can be used to manipulate things. But my feeling is that um, I mean you maybe would have a different opinion on this. My feeling is that like hopefully with like this all this sort of like AI tools that people are using that they can better and hopefully better identify these bots and take them down. Yeah, I mean there's some like real hallmarks of what is a bot um, and people have gotten pretty savvy about identifying it, but it's also just so easy to create a massive yeah. bot net or whatever really quickly that um, if you are trying to, let's say, smear a specific journalist, it, it's just still a very useful way to do that. And then you might get caught, but yeah, it's really, really hard in any way on a tech platform to stop people from posting things. Like what happens is things get posted and then they get taken down. Yeah. The only kind of content that is actually stopped from even being put online is like the most horrendous beheadings, child pornography, like horrible things like that. And that is because of like really complex techno hashing technology and all this stuff that no one is willing to consider putting on other forms of content. Um, so I think that it seems like the scale of these platforms is like the meaningful shift in, it, like in thinking of them as a business. And it, it starts to feel like also just the way that a lot of these social media platforms have gotten kind of, they're starting to feel more and more like utility. And at that point, there's this kind of space where it starts to bleed over into public good, mm -hmm. but in the private domain. And so I'm wondering, especially as we think about governance of these tools and the effects that they have on, you know, democracy, um, how, how should we be thinking about governance, especially because there is this line between the way that, um, you know, civil society is able to police these things, but then the way that that's not necessarily aligned with business incentives. So could you maybe talk about how you think about the, that tension? Yeah, yeah. Um... The question for people in here is sort of like, how do you think about like governance on these platforms and these kind of like, are they they're going to be utilities at this point? I I go back and forth on this so much. I used to be like, break up big tech, like let's all. And then I've seen some of the really bad legislation recently, like that kids one. I can't remember the name of it. Like, there's just so many bad laws that now I'm like, actually don't 
actually, I don't maybe think the government, the current government should really do anything more. Um, only because I think bad legislation, like the only thing worse than no like regulation is like very bad regulation, but I I agree with you that like they're they're so especially Google and Meta are just so big and we need some we need some sort of like recognition of the fact that these are really important communication tools. I think this has come up a lot with TikTok and the ban. It's like, I mean, what TikTok would argue, and I think they're correct, is like this has become a primary communication tool for like you know millions of people in America. And um yeah, I don't know if you ask a question. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm curious though, like it sounds like you have a really unique view that leads you to like kind of be ahead of some of these things before they happen. What do you see as your kind of like unique skills or spidey senses or like the roles that you might maintain that are unexpected of a typical journalist? And then like the second part of that being like, what are you reading from the tea leaves right now in terms of where we're headed? Oh, good question. Um I don't know. I have, I mean, I um I, I talk to a lot of people. I just talk to everyone that I can and try to like hear from as many people. I really like hearing, I love debates. Um, I love hearing from people that I kind of disagree with. Like I'm a little bit contrarian in my own head. So like if I start to think of something, I'm always like, I wonder what like the other person would say. <laughs> I wanted to write a piece recently because there's been so much stuff about like blaming phones for all this negative stuff with kids. And I was like, Maybe I should write a piece that like every child should be on their phone, like maximum. <laughs> just and actually Facebook meta PR was like, we have so much research showing that like, <laughs> that you're right. And like, I was like, uh oh, uh oh, maybe I'm going to have the wrong path. But um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I just like talk to so many people and you eventually hear, especially when you start to hear the same thing from kind of different groups. Yeah, it helps. Okay. Do I need to use it? Um, what do you see as the future of Section 230, and what do you think should be the future of Section 230? Okay, such a good question. I have absolutely no. I was asking. We had this debate at, at the Washington Post in one of our meetings recently, and actually, our tech policy editor had to just. Be like, I don't. <laughs> I worry about, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to, I, I have a lot of, I, I, my thoughts have changed on content moderation a lot because um, having had many of my Instagram accounts banned, meta is so crazy about the, con like, I don't, I, I don't really love the idea of these tech platforms, like doing heavy handed content moderation. Um, but I also don't know, you know, but I, I think that they deserve some, like, especially with what's going on with Twitter right now with the like crazy violence and like just the sort of abject violence, like, the, you know, we shouldn't have a free for all either. So I have no idea. I really don't have good thoughts on it. So do you Section know? 230 protected me against two lawsuits. So, so, okay. I'm pro We're pro. Um, I mean, I agree. I'm not saying, I don't think it should be abolished at all, but I think that like, there should be, I, I mean, I don't think, again, this should be handled by, like, regulation. I would love to just see the platforms be a little bit more responsible. Well, the platforms have been saying, you know, we want to regulate ourselves. Like, let us regulate ourselves. Um, and to my ears, that always used to sound kind of, like, BS. Um, but I actually think that there is a long history of industries regulating themselves and, like, forming groups where they will say, we will have these norms, we will agree to these rules. Like, the alcohol industry will say, like, we will abide by this kind of behavior and everyone in it will come together and, and sign on and the tech industry hasn't done that they've all become they have their own governance structure their own fiefdoms um which then leaves the government like i was just talking to someone at the ftc and she was like oh really upset about this thing that was going on but then the person the people the the entity most able to stop this thing that she was talking about what is the actual tech platforms but because of 230, she's like, well, we're not, we're not even going to touch that. And I do think that in a way, like, it, maybe it shouldn't be abolished, but there needs to be some way in which regulators are actually empowered to do things that would actually matter is the tech companies. Um, or they should be forced to have, like, an industry-wide group that has, like, some norms that they would adhere to. Another oversight board. <laughs> but no, like, not like just an oversight. See, the Facebook oversight board is just, like, theater. <laughs> um, I know it's been a little like uh, touch and go, start and stop on AI influencers, but then today there was the Kendall Jenner meta, in whatever, I Billy, I don't know what it is, but I want to ask you if you think there's any there there, and it seems sort of like 
in the context of what you were saying, it's the platform's attempt to like do that value creation themselves mm -hmm. for their platform um, yeah. and sort of eliminate that tension with compensating um, users that produce that content. So is AI influencing <laughs> ever going to be a real thing? Um, and like, what are your concerns about this? I think it is already in the sense that like a lot of content creators are leveraging AI already to create content um, at scale. Um, I think like a personified person, like that that's it's so weird how people kind of think like that. It like there are tons of those out already, right? Like they have tons of sort of like AI generated people. I think like I don't think that's the future. People mostly want to connect with people. So they might like like a like a essentially like a virtual chatbot version of some person, but they're still fundamentally interested in Kendall Jenner, not the digital ver like you know version. Like it's a fun novelty and like it's a chatbot. Like, oh, it's like I'm chatting with Tom Brady, but um I don't think it's gonna be like the default. And I certainly think that organic influencers that they create that are not people that are just like these like sort of outside of only fans, which they basically create these like AI influencers as like bait to get people into only fans uh, subscriptions. Um, maybe it's useful for that, but like generally people want to connect with other people still. Um, so it might change, but I think we're quite far off from it. Also, most of the technology is not that good yet. It's rapidly getting better. Okay, we have time for one more question, I think. Oh, yeah, so many. Oh, now no one wants to ask. Okay, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, great. Okay. Sorry, um, Anne. Awesome. Thank you for this really terrific book, Taylor. I've been following your work for a while and your meme page on Instagram. Oh. I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a PhD candidate in history here. So reading this book about the period that I lived through and some of the services and stuff that I uh, interacted with is really amazing, such a treat. I'm kind of curious as like the years go by and you know historians start to historicize this period and kind of look at it. Are there any like pivotal or important like moments, periods, entities that you would like suggest to those stories to look at that are that is like emblematic of this history? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I tried to cover like the major events in the book. I think like there's big thing. I mean, I think the ad. I think 2017 was a really pivotal year for the internet. You had the ad apocalypse on YouTube. You had suddenly the Trump's inauguration. You had like. There was just so you had the FTC issuing the first sort of crackdown on sponsored content, which actually just made sponsored content more popular. Um, I, yeah, that year was a big year, um, kind of in the way that like 2008 was a big year. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, I tried to kind of with my book like pick out like the main, the main kind of like periods at least, um, so that people can hopefully. But I'm just trying to think, like, if you're a story in, like, 30 years, what would you, what would you kind of figure out? Well, one of the things I like the most about your book is that you didn't just focus on the well-known influencers and and things that are the ones that won't get forgotten. Yeah. Um, you actually told the story of people who, you know, forged a path or were the kind of, or influencers in a niche community. And that's the kind of stuff that I think gets missed. Well, yeah, like, I mean, the mommy bloggers is the perfect example because people, like, especially all these VCs in 2021, when they, they're a creator economy, like, acting like David Dobrik invented it, everything. And, you know, I, I think a lot of it is was invented by people that have been a little bit written out of history. So I, I hope it does. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you, Taylor.